Please don't forget to go and sign up for the Battlefield 2042 refund petition on change.org. Given the degree of industry-wide shenanigans that went down in 2021, I ended up having to subdivide the crimes and misdemeanours of the video game industry and give it a special, ultra-deviant subclass. I would note that this award is in no way referring to anything other than the typo in the 2021 California vs Activision Blizzard lawsuit, where they referred incorrectly to the Crosby Suite. If anyone was looking for any evidence that neo-Marxist progressive schooling, which focuses on identity politics and intersectional theory, was a bad idea, well now we have a generation of West Coast lawyers entering the legal system that are incapable of spelling a five-letter word that is identical to the last name of one of the most well-known celebrities in the world. But you can bet your ass they won't get any of your pronouns wrong. Oh well, I guess that's what happens when you replace fact-based education with the politico-sexual equivalent of Das Kapital. But I digress. So just in case there are any lawyers watching, this award is named specifically after a typo, a non-existent person who does not exist. So you should jog on and possibly get back to work dealing with your workplace sexual abuse cases. For now at least. I should also note that in my previous video I referred to Bobby Kotick as fucked and I indeed acknowledge that was probably an oversimplification. He certainly appears to be getting chucked out of his job but will most likely be getting a golden parachute to the degree of hundreds of millions of dollars. Effectively, he seems to be getting a couple of years pay and a sack. So yes, by Bobby Billionaire I can afford to buy Belgium Kotick standards, that's a pretty raw deal. But I concede that by the standards of us normal peasants, his idea of a bad day is our idea of winning the lottery. Twice in a week. For several months in a row. So prepare yourselves for a journey through the darkest aspects of the AAA video game industry in 2021. I would strongly advise you all to stockpile some anal bleach, because by the time you've seen what these guys have been up to, you will probably want to scrub yourself clean with it. So come hither, young video game adventurers. Let us skip, hand in hand, through this tranquil meadow of corruption, and hope that the moral vacuum doesn't suck out our fucking lungs. So here are the nominations for 2021's Bill Crosby Award for Deviance in the video game industry. The Cosby Suite story itself. I suppose I should briefly explain the story of the Cosby Suite for anyone who is unfamiliar and for the purposes of context. Bursting out of the swirling maelstrom of sexual harassment and staff abuse allegations which were overwhelming Activision Blizzard's house of ill repute, came the revelation that the worst rumour and accusation of them all turned out to be true. Not only this, but a disgruntled, fired ex-employee decided to share a precious photo of it with the world. The legend of the Cosby Suite was not only a real thing, but now there was proof. In retrospect, this was a victory of optics over sex crimes, but damn, the optics were fucking terrible. Let me illuminate the point by using the science of metaphor. Or maybe simile. I don't know the fucking difference. Imagine if my wife was going on holiday and she was going on said holiday with the wives of all of my mates. Obviously, this means you have to also imagine that I have a wife and that I've got mates. But stick with me here, even though it's a reach. My imaginary wife goes on an imaginary Girls Gone Wild holiday with a bunch of imaginary mates' wives. Yes, I know, the mates' wives are technically imaginary too. 
So me and my imaginary mates decide to go on holiday ourselves at the same time and take all the kids with us, since the husbands are going to be doing the babysitting whilst the wives are away. So we rent a little villa on a little island so the dads and the kids can have some fun. And hell, if you're going to be babysitting the little army of pukers for two weeks, why not turn it into a little holiday getaway? So far, so good. However... What if, in our infinite wisdom, we decide to refer to the holiday island as Epstein's Island? Take lots of booze, send each other text messages about our plans to shag any girl we can get our grubby mitts on, and take pictures of ourselves drunk on a bed, holding up a giant framed picture of Jeffrey Epstein. Suddenly, our little babysitting venture isn't quite as benign. This is the basic dynamic of what happened with the Cosby Suite. A bunch of developers, including key players from Blizzard, would hire a hotel room at BlizzCon, pile it full of booze, and then try and coax women in there to get them drunk and try and cop a shag. Now, they claimed retrospectively that they did not name it the Cosby Suite as some kind of bad taste joke about sexual predating on girls who were inebriated with intoxicants, even though by their own admission in revealed communications, the purpose of said room was to sexually predate on girls that they were actively trying to get inebriated with intoxicants. Not a good foundation for a legal defence, but what do I know? However you spin this, it's fucking dreadful optics, and nobody believes their bullshit excuse that the Cosby Suite joke was based on bad furnishing. Ergo furnishing that looks like Bill Cosby's sweaters. Besides, if it was a joke about sweaters, they would have taken bad sweaters. If it was a joke about Bill Cosby, because at this time he was experiencing a series of accusations of the bedroom slash intoxication variety, you would take a load of booze and a picture of Bill. Which is precisely what they did. As far as I'm aware, there is absolutely no documented evidence of any sexual assault taking place in that room. However, they were hitting on subordinates. They were hitting on young female new hires. They were being handsy and gropey with said staff. We don't know what's been hushed up via settlement and non-disclosure agreements. Alex Afrasabi, one of the developers involved with the organisation of the Cosby Suite, was independently fired from Blizzard for a separate string of sexual harassment incidents. And not trivial ones. And not just a few. So fuck knows what he is capable of in a closed hotel room with a shit-faced girl passed out on the bed. And I guess it's worth noting that Afra Sabi is quite the proverbial fanny grabber when he's at work. Sober. So God knows what he's capable of at 4am in the morning after sinking half a bottle of rum. And this is the really sinister thing. The Cosby Suite was lauded as a location for informal networking at BlizzCon. On a professional level, of course. But as far as the Cosby Suite organisers were concerned, and certainly according to their own DMs to each other, their agenda seemed to be, and I quote, gathering the hot chicks for the cos. Be sweet. Whatever did or did not occur in that room, the precise dynamic was sleazy and predatory. Girls went into that room thinking it was an opportunity to meet and network with powerful influential managers in the industry. Sometimes managers at their own employer. But those guys, by their own admissions, were there to get their dicks wet. Desperate aspiring video game fans and developers an immense power disparity, combined with alcohol. In the film industry, they would call that a casting couch. The Cosby Suite, misspelled as the Crosby Suite, was listed in California's litigation of Activision Blizzard, and it was one item on a very, very long list, and at the time was considered perhaps the worst incident of bad PR to have ever occurred within the AAA video game industry. But fuck it, this is 2021 we're talking about, and this incident only held that title for about eight fucking minutes. Which brings us neatly on to... 
Activision Blizzard managers stealing and drinking human breast milk. Oh, Activision, the bad PR gift that keeps on giving. In the middle of this shitstorm of bad press, a lone voice could be heard through the mist. Suddenly, a former female breastfeeding Activision developer busted out on Twitter detailing how her human breast milk was stolen at work. Then another female breastfeeding developer complained that her breast milk was stolen and invoked the spectre of creepy motives. And talking of creepy, I suppose that strictly speaking, there was no need for me to use the term female breastfeeding developer, because you would assume the developer breastfeeding the kid was female, right? Well, we live in strange times. But I've not been able to produce any milk. By the time I heard about this story, it had been signal boosted, inferences had been promoted to allegations, and speculation had taken on corporeal physical form. And by the time the story reached me, it sounded more like a human, breast milk based, vampire analogue comedy horror Netflix movie. Something along the lines of Activision Blizzard managers are stealing and drinking human breast milk. I could literally imagine them crouching in the corner drinking it. Personally, I've always found the whole concept of breastfeeding babies to be a ludicrously inefficient way to raise a child, especially if you're taking care of it at work. There are loads of perfectly fine dehydrated milk products that do the job much better, like Nescafe, or Nesquik, Coffee Whitener, or whatever the fuck it's called. Besides, if the kid's that thirsty, go and get it a fucking can of coke from the vending machine. It's too young to know the difference. Idiots. Don't these women know anything? I would really love to take the story at face value. I was gleefully conjuring up images in my head of skeevy senior blizzard managers sucking the little breast milk bags dry in a dark corner of the office, like vampires drinking from blood bags in Blade. Blade the TV series, of course, starring Sticky Fingers and Jill Wagner. But sadly, I looked into it, and I think people have run away with themselves, frankly. Which makes my little withered leathery heart sink. Nobody has actually been caught drinking the milk. There is no factual accusations that anyone saw someone drinking the milk. Nobody actually knows if it was stolen, or just thrown in the bin. Because bags of breast milk are creepy. This is all implied, or inferred, by the breastfeeding accusers, or the media. Thus far, it certainly seems to all trace back to some accusations on Twitter. Accusations from people that have pronouns in their bios. One of whom had political references in her bio. I'm not saying that they're lying. I'm just saying that they are not what I would call impartial witnesses, and certainly have documented agendas regarding putting Activision in a bad light. Justified or not. I would also note that a couple of isolated incidents of people shit-flinging on Twitter does not a legal case make. It could have been another mum nicking it for her kid. It might not have happened at all. The bags might have leaked, and someone threw them out. But representing the situation as some kind of systematic wholesale routine theft of human breast milk by Activision Blizzard managers so they could skulk off together for their post-work communal breast milk drinking orgy is a bit of a fucking reach. Like I said, I would love this to be true, but all we really know is that a couple of blue hairs on Twitter had a paddy, threw some accusations out on Twitter, about a couple of bags of human breast milk going missing, and they were two separate, lone, isolated incidents. With situations like these, you need to employ a little empathy, neutrality, and some sensitivity. So to use a personal example, hypothetically. Say I had been in a position where I needed to return a little plastic container to the sperm donor clinic at lunchtime, but my break wasn't for another three hours. If I popped that in the fridge, it's not impossible that someone might just see it and throw it in the bin. Some people might not particularly want to see human excretions in the food fridge, but if it did go missing, I would not 
automatically assume that someone had fucking drunk it. Even though technically they're both human excretions and routinely consumed orally. This drinking human breast milk story seems to be incredibly conflated and exaggerated in my opinion, but regardless of its veracity, it's still fucking awesome. I have dined out on it a few times myself, but as they like to say on YouTube, this is just my personal opinion on the subject. Let me know about your experiences of leaving your bodily fluids in workplace food refrigerators down in the comments section. PlayStation Executive fired after being filmed trying to pedo up a 15 year old boy. It has always been my personal opinion that we should not be at all surprised that the AAA video game industry predates on the vulnerable. Precisely because it's an industry that attracts predators. Everyone seems to have a blind spot for the video game industry, but this is a well-known phenomenon in other similar industries, and the whole of the entertainment industry generally. Predators like to insert themselves into positions where they have power, authority, control, in jobs where they have easy access to their target victims. This is absolute standard dogma in security and vetting, and it has been a well-known dynamic in social care and policing strategy for decades. Pedos want to get jobs caring for vulnerable children. Creepers gravitate towards the kids' entertainment industry so they can predate on fans. Rapists love the film and modelling industries because people will do anything to get famous, and even more, not to be blacklisted, and their careers terminated. It's an inevitable dynamic of power and access to vulnerable people. Like lions hanging around the waterhole waiting for zebras. Look, if you like blowing shit up, you try and get a job in demolition. If you like getting high, you get a job as a doctor. If you like arson, you get a job at a petrol station. This is all perfectly understandable, normal and healthy. It stops being healthy when, for example, you like getting sucked off by underage cosplayers, so you become a community manager at a video game company. Allegedly. Or in this case, you like fingering 15 year old boys in the bum, so you get a job working for PlayStation. Apparently the sting was streamed live on YouTube. Damn those pesky YouTubers. Always getting in the way of the AAA industry's dastardly plans. The single most disgusting aspect of this entire situation really shows us the kind of utter monster we are dealing with here. When George Kakiopu answered the door to greet his underage sex victim, the callous bastard was wearing a PS5 t-shirt. If you were going to traumatise someone, dear God, show some compassion and don't wear branded clothing. When the victim is suffering from PTSD years later, every time he sees a PlayStation 5 logo, he's going to have a flashback. I guess at least a PS5 will only be around for a finite time before it becomes obsolete, so it's better than sexually abusing someone whilst wearing a Coca-Cola or a BMW t-shirt, but still, he could have shown some compassion and worn something with Ubisoft branding. If you are planning on doing something to someone that's going to give them PTSD, at least have the common courtesy to avoid imprinting the experience with widely prevalent logos, and certainly not with popular music playing. They will always associate that track with the horror of their experience. If you need something playing in the background, choose something neutral that they probably won't ever hear again. Like any edgy podcasts on Spotify. Because that shit is all going to be gone by the end of the year. The revelations that Bobby Kotick threatened to have his personal assistant killed. Setting aside people who are shit-faced drunk or high, because they're capable of anything, there are two types of people making death threats that I personally take very seriously. One, someone who has nothing, and nothing to lose. And two, someone who has everything. 
The extreme ends of the spectrum are a high threat. The people in the middle, as a general principle at least, tend to be less dangerous, because they might make wild threats, but they don't have the resources to do it properly, and they have enough of a life that they don't want to throw it away. If a junkie shoplifter from Port Glasgow threatens to kill someone, well that's a problem. An incredibly angry person with literally nothing to lose is dangerous. If serving 15 to 20 years in a prison could end up being a quality of life improvement, then that is not much of a disincentive to do something stupid. But similarly, I'm very wary of people at the other end of the spectrum. The elites of this world live by a completely different set of rules to us peons. We've seen this with other revelations in the press recently. As a general principle, if you are so filthy rich that you can afford giant luxury yachts, buy private islands and get invited to parties where you rub shoulders with the world's most powerful and influential politicians, chances are you can get things done with zero consequences that other people can't get done at all. Mainly because people like this have virtually unlimited financial resources and access to the sorts of specialist services that people don't generally advertise on the internet. So when Bobby Kotick phones his personal assistant and leaves a voicemail message explicitly threatening to have her killed, that should be a red flag. And note, he did not say he was going to kill her, he threatened to have her killed. Say what you like about Bobby Kotick, and I mean really say what you like about him, his list of shady actions is both huge and a matter of public record. However, I don't think anyone could argue that he's an ineffective individual. In fact, if you look at his career, the billions, yes, billions of dollars he has amassed, and how he has successfully avoided being dethroned for so long, despite a litany of damning revelations and bad press, I would say that Bobby Kotick is a highly effective individual. So when a highly effective multi-billionaire businessman leaves you a message threatening to have you killed, I would personally question whether that really was words said in the heat of the moment, or whether really it was a window of true nature. Perhaps it was our little glimpse behind the curtain where we get to see how the elites of this world really live. Irrespective of whether he was good for it or not, I would just note this. Depending on where you live in America, it's a ballpark figure of up to 10 years in prison for giving someone a credible death threat. If his assistant had threatened to kill Bobby Kotick, she would have seen the inside of a prison cell. Even if the charges were eventually dropped, she would have spent time locked up until the situation was resolved. But when Bobby Kotick does it to her, it's all settled out of court, on the quiet, no charges, no arrests were made, no jail time for Bobby. I have no idea how factually real that death threat was, but God knows he's got the money and the power to get it done. I just hope that one day some real professional journalist sits down and goes through Bobby's past with a fine tooth comb and settles the matter. Because if it turns out there are lots of cases of mysterious heart attacks, unexplained suicides and mystery car crashes on remote country lanes, following in Bobby Kotick's wake, well it wouldn't be the first time I've heard of that kind of phenomenon. All mainstream journalists who are politically gatekeeping the video game industry. Something I keep finding myself muttering under my breath when playing video games these days is the following phrase. I paid for a video game, not a fucking lecture. And the problem of woke politics polluting video games is a systemic and all-pervasive rot that manifests throughout the video game industry from top to bottom. Woke journalists are gatekeeping video games. Woke journalists are gatekeeping their own industry. Woke journalists see their primary job as activist and not journalist. The mainstream video game journalism industry sees its crusade as proselytising a certain specific political agenda, punishing games that don't conform to that agenda, and obstructing the careers of any journalist that does not align with that agenda. Sophia Narwitz wrote an exceptional and now famous article discussing the political gatekeeping in video game journalism, where she highlights the incredible degree of hypocrisy that routinely occurs. 
The woke get a hall pass, but they dogpile targets for minor breaches in woke etiquette. One clear conclusion was that no one who is openly conservative has a snowball's chance in hell of getting hired by most outlets. Then there is the issue of corruption. Access journalists need to maintain the illusion that they are siding with the customer, when the brute reality is that their number one priority is remaining on good terms with the publisher so they can maintain their privileged access to interviews and early access copies of the video games. The dynamic is simple. They have to pretend they are poachers in the pub, but at night, they are the fucking gamekeepers. Gatekeeping in the video game industry is like some little unholy virtuous circle. A little hate engine, if you will. Corporations pretend to be woke because it's good for marketing and sales. Any game that is not woke risks getting cancelled or attacked by the journos. Other journos play along because they don't want to get cancelled by their colleagues. Everybody plays along because they are all afraid of the spectre of punishment and cancellation. Everyone is shit scared of getting dogpiled for some perceived politically incorrect transgression. And not enough people are telling these guys to fuck off. It's some serious, hardcore, cultural revolution, national socialist grade fuckery. And it really is starting to approach that level of oppression. And that is not hyperbole. Lives are being ruined. Careers are being destroyed. Businesses are being burned down. People are attacked in the streets. The authorities are arresting people for politically incorrect social media posts. All for failing to align with a particular political message. As I've said many times before, I have no skin in this game. I am politically agnostic. I think all politicians are primarily self-serving scum. I don't think the government has our best interests at heart. Healthy political debate requires everyone have the right to speak. And nobody should live in a world where saying the wrong thing might destroy their life because an angry rabble decides they are guilty of wrong think. And just as we should have our freedom of speech protected, or protect it ourselves, we should not deny it to others. Seriously, I mean that. I've seen some people say some stupid shit on Twitter, but I would not for an instant try and interfere with their right to say it. So when people will only talk to journalists like Sophia Narwitz about the issues under guarantees of absolute anonymity because they're afraid their careers and personal lives will be destroyed, or they might be doxxed like JK Rowling, well that is some fairly chilling medieval levels of witch burning. The end result is of course that developers and publishers are turning their games into fucking woke-gasms because they have to get past the gatekeeping mainstream journalists. They are bending the knee and pumping out woke crap, partially out of fear of getting fucked over by the reviewers. Our games are getting more shit, year on year, because they are pampering to a cabal of journalists that don't represent the best interests, or the tastes, or the agenda of your average video game playing punter. Days Gone, an excellent game, gets a shitty reception primarily because it isn't woke enough. I heard someone claim that one of the developers said that in hindsight, he wished he'd made the game more woke, just so it got a better review from the journos. Kingdom Come Deliverance didn't play the woke game at all, and Warhorse Studios got attacked for being wacists, because they apparently didn't have enough racial diversity in 14th century fucking Bohemia. What the actual fuck? And then Neil Druckmann sharts out The Last of Us 2, a quite literal fuckfest of gender ambiguous identity politics anti-cis white male dog shit that most players hated. So what happens? Despite Naughty Dog and Sony abusing the DMCA process and striking down independent critics, they got a complete hall pass from the mainstream press. The game wins more awards than a doped up Chinese gymnast, its game of the year, lauded as a fucking masterpiece, yet was so hated by customers that even with the pressure being placed on review sites to massage the numbers under the pretense of alleged review bombing, it still got a shitty score. And let us not forget that these allegedly user-driven independent impartial review sites mostly make their money from advertising. 
Think about that. This game had a Metacritic score of 3.4 and miraculously, and under not insignificant pressure, magically it climbed up to 5.7. So basically now, if the mainstream journalists announce a game is being review bombed, its user score will magically go up. There are insidious levels of influence and collusion here. The ratings disparity has really become the new normal in video games now, and that is a serious sign that something is profoundly broken in video games journalism. It is becoming almost routine that grown-up professional video game activists, I mean journalists, rate games completely out of sync with the average gamer. Look for yourself. You see this so often these days. Journos love a game. Players hate it. Players love a game. Journos hate it. That is a phenomenon that used to be so rare that it was newsworthy when it happened. I seem to remember Total Biscuit even making a video about this with the game Mad Max. But these days, these days, it's absolutely normal. And we've become used to it. Whoever these journalists are rating these video games for, they are certainly not rating these games for the customers and average gamers. And perhaps this is the critical part of this whole section. It occurred to me that mainstream video game reviewers these days are consciously really rating video games for marketing departments. Mainstream reviews may now really be a gold seal of approval from the journos. Effectively saying, this game meets our approval. This game is politically woke enough. There is nothing here that offends our politics or sensibilities. Go ahead. Stick your branding on the marketing tie-ins. Advertise on its trailers. You are safe to proceed. We will not attack you if you are associated with this video game. I don't know if these are conscious editorial decisions by the outlets or an ideological outcome, but the end result is the fucking same. Either way, the facts align with this proposition. Mainstream video game reviewers service the interests of marketing departments and not the players. I don't personally care what someone's politics are. If these journalists believe in communism and they want to set up an animal reserve for pansexual fucking hamsters and use tampons made out of recycled nuclear waste, I don't give a shit. They are entitled to their opinions like everyone else, however childish, nonsensical and baffling they may be. But it does become an issue when their politics start ruining video games. And I don't believe a lot of these people are even genuine. I think most of them are acting out of fear or greed. But the end result is, video games as a creative endeavour are becoming more shit because of these political activists. And their job, apparently, is to tell us if we will like the game. I will just repeat that. A video game journalist's job is to tell us if we will like it. And despite all the energy they're expending on self-promotion, political activism, doing charity work, cancelling people and dogpiling innocence, the one fucking job they seem incapable of doing is the job they're being paid to do. Because if journos were doing their fucking jobs and representing the player's best interests instead of the corporation's interests, we would not be routinely seeing red on one side and green on the other. Like I said, I paid for a video game, not a fucking lecture. People who work in monetization and loot box technology. If we tell people they are a certain way, if we compliment them on, on being nice, good citizens, they are more likely to behave as nice, good citizens. So you should actually tell your players that they are uh, generous individuals who, who have a, a taste for good art and, and uh, want to support their, um, their game developers by paying you and buying IAPs. In the beginning, there was oblivion. Then out of nothing burst everything we know and can know. Time, space and matter 
exploded into existence out of nothing. Over the course of 14 billion years, the scorching heat and primordial matter coalesced into coherence. Everything we can see today fell into a complex gravitational cosmic dance, where giant spheres of rock and gas swirled around even more gigantic spheres of primeval nuclear fire. And these themselves danced in a swirling mass on a galactic scale, which themselves became part of this seemingly infinite mass of interconnected energy, gravity and time. On one small, fragile and insignificant ball of rock and water, something miraculous occurred. For reasons we still do not understand, nor comprehend, life spontaneously came into being. And in the time it took our humble Earth, our home, 3.7 billion years to circle around our precious ball of burning gas, life evolved and human beings walked the Earth. A race of self-conscious entities, that could not only see and feel the world they lived in, but be self-aware of these sensations and their experience of being. And for some people, this was all just one giant fucking opportunity to fuck over and exploit other people. During their one tiny window of experiencing this thing we call life. Make sure that your games aren't too skill-based. I made that mistake myself. A too skill-based game, you don't get people to pay, for, pay you because there's no reason to. Seriously, what the fuck are these people thinking? 14 billion years of precisely the right shit happening so that we can all experience this wonderful thing called life. And for some people, that's just a cracking chance to sit at a desk and find ways to make other people's lives more miserable and suck their money out of the bank in the process. What pitiful excuses of human beings. Words cannot adequately describe how much I hate this shit, and God knows, I've said it many different ways over the years. These people design algorithms that can identify intoxicated players so they can target them and encourage them to make bad purchasing choices. They design algorithms that can analyse the emotional state of the player. They manipulate their customers to frustrate and annoy them, while shoveling in-game purchases and pedo caches up into their grills. They manipulate drop rates so players get close to completion but then deny them their last drop, wasting their time and effort in an attempt to drive them to buy it for cash. They chop up games into chunks and serve up the removed portions of the game and present them as Launch Day DLC. They actively and deliberately deploy weaponized psychology against the very same customers they're constantly on social media bleating on about caring for. We are facing an epidemic of gambling addiction. It's the big tobacco scandal of our generation and these guys are hiring specialists to promote and amplify it. Fuck these guys and fuck the shills that promote it. Excuse it and apologize for it. I'm serious. I have seen my fair share of content creators acting as apologists for monetization that I know are getting paid. Anyone spending their life engaging in this sort of behavior is worthless scum and the gift of life was wasted on them. They will be judged in this life or the next. If there is a god, then they will be judged in the next life. And if there's not, then they squandered their only shot at this wonderful thing we call life by spending it on being a dirty shit heel and their only contribution is making this world a slightly shittier place. But let us not dwell on the despondent. Why don't we lift the mood a little by talking about the next nomination? Ubisoft. Yeah, just generally Ubisoft in all its sickening glory. When an internet movement starts up because of your track record of abuse and bullshitting about it, well that's not good. I've had many dealings with the cuckoldry and sinister activities of these bastards, and I can tell you this, they are all smiles and cuddles on the outside, but they're like Freddy Krueger on the inside. They conduct harassment by proxy using their underlings and affiliates, and they virtue signal like motherfuckers, whilst being possibly the most sinister company I've ever had dealings with. They abuse their staff, and when they complain to HR, they fuck them off to other countries. Allegedly. Well, surprise, sir fucking prize. The rot runs straight down from the top to the lowliest peon, suck-up affiliate YouTuber and streamer. Because I've seen their fucking antics as well. The star players, 
and the Ubisoft Elite Task Force members. They win their ticket to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and most of them come back changed. They might head out there like Charlie Bucket, but they come back behaving like Augustus Gloop. Although in retrospect many of them showed telltale signs of gloopness, long before they headed off to shove their faces in the chocolate trough. Ubisoft's staffing crisis MO appears to be this. What they say they do? We're super nice to everyone and care lots and like unicorns and marshmallows. What they really do? Facilitate and protect sex pests, abusers and harassers over the span of possibly decades and deploy HR to crush anyone who complains, even if, especially if, that means drumming them out of the industry and putting them out of work. Allegedly. I am not in possession of the full facts, so I can only speculate based on my personal experiences and the many, many news reports. And I would speculate that they're probably ten times worse than the stories that have leaked. In fact, they're probably more like a hundred times worse. Behaving like Ubisoft is both the crime and the punishment. Their habitual deception and misconduct has finally come home to roost, and their name is now shit in the industry. So at least it's comforting to know that sometimes karma is a bitch. Although I did hear a rumour from a close associate that Microsoft might be about to buy Ubisoft. And I guess by now it must be a bidding war between them and Sony. And yes, I know I mispronounced Sony. It upsets them. Just like saying Ubisoft upsets them too. Please allow me the few little moments of joy I get these days. So I guess I should announce the winner of this year's Bill Crosby Award for Deviance in the Video Game Industry. And it goes to everyone who works in monetization and loot box technology. And while we're at it, anyone that's associated with them. They win because they are not just ripping people off over a video game, they are continuing to rip them off over time. They're not just manipulating and exploiting people, but they're actively engaged in normalizing and encouraging and promoting their own sadistic activities. And most importantly, because they are actively engaged in encouraging addictive behaviours and causing real-life financial psychological harm to their targets. Congratulations, shitburgers. Your prize is going down in the history of technology as possibly the scummiest manifestation of abusive tech since Facebook algorithms, email porn blackmailing scams and ransomware. Everything these guys do is shitty. And they are shitty and they can look forward to their own children growing up in a world that is just that little bit shittier because of their legacy. As a footnote about all the revelations of workplace scandals in the video game industry, it should all come as no surprise because of the simple laws of supply and demand. The entertainment industry has always been rife for abuse because people will do anything and tolerate too much to get into showbiz. And the video games industry is now the biggest sector in show business. You don't hear about these sorts of incidents in, say, the mortician industry for exactly the same reasons. Supply and demand. The demand for morticians is high, but the supply is low, because most people don't fancy spending their time in a basement pumping formaldehyde up a corpse's arse. Hence the money and conditions is also good, because they need to recruit and retain people. Although, personally, I would love to be a mortician. Seems like an interesting, worthy job. And an opportunity to meet chicks. I did say that with my inside voice, right? I guess it's time for me to get going. I have an appointment with destiny. And by destiny, I mean I intend to spend some quality time having a bunch of teenage squeakers screech racist abuse at me. You guessed it. I'm reviewing Rainbow Six Extraction. Wish me luck. I hear it's hell in there. If you took anything away from this video, it should be this. Don't pre-order video games. Don't trust mainstream video game journalism. The universe is 14 billion years old. Bobby Kotick has 50 cents for every year the universe has been in existence. And that sucks. But for now... Good luck and happy hunting.